بالله من السيد الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين الدين سرط مستقيم سرط لاتين أثر لهم قليل ما تبى لهم ولا تولين Amin. Well, for the brothers that wasn't here last week, uh, last time, Talim, and then we see that Imam Rashidin and the sisters and brothers have made a safe trip. We haven't heard no bad news, so we automatically know that, <coughs> all praise due to Allah, that they are back safely. We want to talk about what I talked about last week. I want to talk, teach about uh, jihad. <clears throat> it's very important that we remember that last week I was talking about jihad is the striving and the fighting for the cause of Allah. It's three things when brothers come in mind and say, when they say jihad, most brothers think we're going to fight with weapons. But this jihad that I'm asking the elders <clears throat> and the brothers and sisters that can vote in the government, we know that it's election time. This is our jihad now. This is our time. We can make a difference with our children on participating in this. So we have to get out and uh, emphasize and voting and put the people in office that's supposed to be there. And we don't want someone there, don't vote for them. You know, they're going to build a big casino downtown. And we know that this is wrong, this is Haran. <clears throat> and the mayor is all for it. And he's taking your tax dollars and using it for Haran. So we don't really want that man in there. You know, it don't matter if he's black or white or whatever. We want a man that's in there for righteous, for truth. And then two, when we go to vote this weekend, don't go alone. Take someone that's younger that never voted before. Take your kids, stop enough, uh, your children or people that haven't seen this before, that don't even know how to go to the polls and vote, don't even know what district. We should try to take someone else so they can learn how to do it for themselves. Just teaching them how to fish in the society. Because these people's going to regulate their life. They have an emphasis on their life. So we have to go out and teach, teach these children, take your your children, show them how to go. Well, we're going to vote for this person because he is a righteous man, I believe, and he's going to do what he say. And we're not. And this is jihad, you know. And this is jihad against the government. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says <clears throat> there was three things of jihad. Jihad with your heart, the soul, yourself. Jihad with your hand, weapons, and the cellar. And jihad with tongue, doing dawah work, form dawah work. So now we need to do this jihad in the government, and we need to get off our tails and go and vote. Because you make a difference for me and my children if you go out and vote and participate in this jihad this week. So that was pretty much what I talked about last, last uh, Talim. I'm not going to emphasize much on that. I'm going to go right to what Allah says about the family structure and why it's so important to Muslims to be married. And this couple, Al Nasser, 
So far, I am 27. One twenty-seven, and it says in the Al Quran here, they ask, they instruction concerning the woman, say, Allah do instruct you about them, and remember what have been rehearsed unto you in the book concerning the orphan of a woman, to whom. Ye give not the portion prescribed, and yet whom ye desire to marry. As also concerning the children who are weak and oppressed, that ye stand firm for justice to the orphans. There is not a good deed which ye do and which ye do, but Allah is well adequate therewith. Talking about the family unity, all praise be unto Allah for my grandfather. He was a great, great example for our family unity. And we, it starts in the home. We gotta teach it unity right in the home. I was Telling my wife some of the things that it stuck with me. My grandfather's gone, long gone now. He's deceased now. But some of the things that he taught me is still there. Family unity. Grandfather set the best example, even from Abraham to Muhammad, set the best example for unity. We all heard the saying, the family that prays together stays together. One of us can't be in one accord. It's a lot of time, and just one of us want to pray, and the rest of us not coming along in the battle. If, may peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad. In the Hadith, it says, But only if ye knew that coming together three, if you pray <coughs> by yourself, you get the barakah for it and the blessing for it, but if you come together and pray together, more barakah is for it. Allah says you get more barakah just to come together and pray together. So it's so important for Baja, Zor, Asa, my bread. It's your prayer time to come together, two, two or more. Like this weekend, it was uh, uh, Juma time. And I was on a trailer, and I met another, another Muslim brother. And I told the brother, I said, you know, you can make, you can call out the and I might leave this lot. He said, oh, no, no, brother, I got to go take this trailer. I said, my brother, that trailer, you got five, ten minutes? I uh, know, that trailer can wait. Those customers can wait five, ten minutes. Ain't going to miss you five, ten minutes? I said, but he said, well, I, I made my prayer when I get there. I said, brother, if you only knew. The Prophet Muhammad, the peace of the Father, he said, if you only knew how much more vodka that you're going to get from praying with someone else than just by yourself. If only you knew. I told the Prophet, I said, if you only knew. I said, this is Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. Come on, brother. I, brother, I just said, you can go to Master man. You're going to support me in Master I said, I know I can go to Master I know it, man. I, I'm saying, you here. We can have Juma right here, real quick. Real short, we can have Juma right here. We don't have a masjid, we, we can form our own Juma, right there. Three brothers, don't even three brothers to form, form a Juma, have Juma right there. One brother call out there, one brother lead a slide, and, and we get one bro brother to do the cookbook. Alhamdulillah. So we need to, you know, be more concerned about this, this uh, prayer, prayer is, it's a major concept in our, in our life. But family unity. And what I just read out of the Quran is that to explain marriage is a must for Muslims. I mean, it also teaches in the Quran um, to stay away 
forbid yourself until the time of, of marriage. But it's a must in the family. We have to teach this. Family unity and instruction in the home. And it starts right there. How can we come out here and say we're going to get down with somebody else? And we ain't got no structure in the home. Everybody's praying at whenever they feel like it and doing whatever they feel like it in your own home. You got no structure in your own home. So how can we get down to the brothers and the sisters that's out here in the society, humanity? How can we do that? We can't do that. It's impossible for us to do such thing. We have to start right there in the home. And I was giving my wife a zap. I said, Grandfather, we ate at the same time. And all, everybody knew what time Grandfather said, eating time. <laughs> Grandma prepared the food. The food was on the table. When Granddad would sit down and say the prayers, and when he was done, that was it. You messed stop. Once that, that kitchen was clean, that's it. You don't get nothing. Well, Grandma would plead sometimes, well, you know that boy had to play baseball. He was, uh, well, he'll, he'll, that obsession, you know, he'd go for that. But you was just gone and it got dark on you. And, uh, when I was a kid, he didn't play. At 8 o'clock, when that street light come on, you better be running to the house fast. I mean, you better be getting boogie. Because when you get there and you see that street light on, then I tell you not to let that street light beat you. Because he's going to beat you when you get there. You know, so, you know what I mean, the, the children today just, you know, the street light catch them, they don't even think about the street light. They keep playing, keep playing. You got to go out and find them. You got to search for them. We should not have to go out and find our children and, and, and how to look, call their name three or four times. Tisha, where is she at? Don't even know where she at. Don't even know what house she at around the corner. You're supposed to know what your children are at at all times. You're supposed to know the people that they, they consult themselves with. You're supposed to know what kind of, is they decent people? Is, do they have morals and ethics like you? They're going to have some type of morals and ethics like you. If they ain't got no morals and ethics, no good morals and ethics, they, you don't just let your kids go around there. Why you want to let your kids go around there? They got bad ethics around there, bad morals. Teach them how to cuss. Teach them not how to be disrespectful. You teach them all the time how to be respectful in the home. But then when they leave and go around the corner to their friend's house, their friend, mom and dad ain't teaching no morals and ethics around there. So they learn disrespect in someone else's home. So you have to watch where you let your children go. You have to watch it. And I mean, I'm just not emphasizing on mom and dad, grandfathers and grandparents, uncles, sisters, elder brothers. It's all our concerns, not just one our concern, not just because you the bottom of the parents, it's y'all concern too. I mean, you see my child doing something, let me know, I'm tell them, this is wrong. Matter of fact, give him a whooping if you need it. I can understand that because I was raised about that. That's why I said I thank granddaddy for setting the best family unity for me. He set the best example. And then, and then we go to El Quran, we can see from Abraham and to Muhammad, set the best example. May peace be upon the prophet Isa. They family structure, structured, uh, it says it quoted from the Bible, that they prayed together. They, that's where that, we pray together, we stay together, come from. That, that's where that concept came from, from the prophet Isa's family. You know, we pray together, we stay together. So we need, when, when it's prayer time, we need to come together in the house of unity, prayer time, you know. So I'm going to uh, end it right here. It's a lot of time, and I'm going to call, um, but I forgot to get off nine or he. As-salatu wa salamu ala khayru muslim muhammadin an nabiyyu umiyyi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. أما بعد يا عباد الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله الله أكبر الله أكبر you know when we say الحمد لله we're deflecting the praise from us see I can't say الحمد brother Kendry I can't say that I say, Alhamdulillah, all the praises that can possibly be given is to Allah. 
I can say shukran, I can say thank you, Brother uh, Kendrick, uh, Brother so-and-so, Brother, thank you. We say, you know, shukran, shukrullah. But it's an expression we say, alhamdulillah. All the praises do is due to your creator. And when we say the creator, we're only speaking of one of the attributes of Allah. You know, some say, well, the creator, I've said it. The creator means God, that's it. The creator is just one of the many attributes of God. But we can't define God. I can't, you know, how can I define that which is eternal, that which has no end? You know, some of the mind that I, we, now we have captured God. We can define God. No, this is a foolish notion. And we're going to speak just for a few moments, but before we get into our subject, we, uh, you know, we, we did the Juma, and we came back from our convention in uh, Sarcasus or Sarcasus. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that word correctly, but Sarcasus or Caucus, uh, New Jersey. And as always, it's a, it's a great honor to be with the broader uh, Muslims in our association. Uh, in particular, but it's always good to be around Muslims. And um, um, that's, that's good. And we just finished our prayer. And the more we learn about prayer, we're going to start a, uh, we're going to start our Arabic class like we started before. I was in a convention. I picked up this book by Dr. Nedwi. I like this particular book because it has the Quran as its base in learning the language, the Fusa, the, the Luga. So we're going to uh, uh, start that once again. Uh, uh, we'll start with the alphabets. We'll start with the Hufal, the Hufal uh, the, um, the Hijab. we start with the alphabets. we start with the particles, the consonants. And um, uh, uh, this will be a great asset to us. So when we go into the Quran, that we'll be, you know, we'll understand a lot more well, what's happen, happening with it, with regards to the language? Because some some like, you know some words you cannot take out of their environment. You take the word out of its environment; it's another word, and they're important. These things are important. It's like with our uh, uh, leader, Imam Warthin Muhammad. You know, some people well, we don't need a leader. Everyone needs leadership. You may not need a leader. Allah is the creator of all of us. We follow Prophet Muhammad. Yes, but we need leadership. You know, some are so big now, they know so much. When you say you're a leader, they look down on you. So, uh, as pointed out to us, that we live in an oppressive word environment. And we don't understand what these words meant, how these words are meant by different communities. Some communities are saying the same words that we're saying. We have to know the difference. If someone else says faith, the way they understand faith, the way they understand truth, the way they understand reality, we have to understand these things. You know, it's, it's one word, you know, the, the, the word I think in the Hebrew for uh, for Version is betula, and for a young woman is alama, and in the Greek is parthenos. You see, so here's books, here's religious books and scriptures, and when you translate this word and that word, and you say, oh, in the in the Septuagint, the book that the Gentiles they say the Gentiles have, you know, the, the arrogant Yahudi say, well, we gave the the Goy, the Gentile religion. We gave them religion. So he says, uh, uh, the Pathinos, and you look at a Persian. But in the original Hebrew, it's Alina, young woman. So there's a difference. You know, and I think it's a uh, fellow Ahmed Dida does a lot, of, a lot of research in comparative religion, understand with words and their meanings, etc. Very interesting sort of a, a presentation that he makes. So. These words are very, very important. So we have to understand what they mean, the effect, and whatever. We have to constantly rehearse what the words mean. And we never present it dogmatically. This is a religion that you grow into. You don't grow out of it. 
There's some right here that should be right sitting right down with all of us. But they, they are way up. <laughs> they feel that their cup, you can't, nothing else can get in their cup. <laughs> okay, so we just want to deal with the subject. And uh, briefly, we don't want to keep you too long. We'd like to thank our brother, our brother Kudus, Abdul Kudus. The brother is very energetic. In fact, he just he's new in our association, but he's come. He and his wife and his, his daughter's there. And he seems to have to exude a certain enthusiasm and, and whatever. So we have to be enthusiastic. And it's, it's, it's always an opportunity for us to teach and to grow and learn. So we want to just deal with the subject and the importance of the Word of God. The importance of God's word, Allah's word. And if we read in Quran, Audu Billahi Mini Shaitan Raji. This is in Surah 19, Ayat, Ayat 35, for those that brought the Quran with them. Ayat 35. What page? Well, it's going to be a different page for you guys. You might have more commentary in it. Just look at the ayat. The numbers, the numbers generally coincide. 19, Surah 19, ayat, ayat, ayat. And then what is ayat? Ayat is a sign. Ayat. Just like you hear the uh, ayat, you know, they say, Khomeini. Ayatullah, Ruhullah, Ruh, the spirit. Ayat to Allah, an ayat, a sign of Allah. So this word, you hear more about that. So uh, this is uh, uh, in uh, Surah uh, 19, Ayat 35. Okay? Ch chapter 19, Ayat 35. You got it, Brother Tyler? Uh, you got it? Yes, sir. Ayah 35? Yes, sir. Ma kana? Ma kana illahi. Okay, now, we will read this. Ma kana lillahi an yat ta'ajjida min walid. See? Yes, sir. Ma kana lillahi. Now, this word lillahi. Now there's a rule. Whenever you pronounce the word Allah, you notice the sound Lillahi. Well, if it was preceded by a, a, a fatta, it would be Lillahi. There's a rule for that. In reading Arabic, in pronouncing Allah's name, those that by the ear, they hear the way you pronounce it, Lillahi, Lillahi. There's a difference in the ear. So if you pronounce the word differently, you might be saying a different word with a different meaning. That's how important it is. So you don't come dogmatically with all, we're all learning. But there's a rule. The rule is uh, tafkim and talqiq. We get into that, we get into the language, but we, we won't deal with that right now. Ma kana lillahi an yattajida min walid, walid. Subhanahu, Either. See that? You got that metta? That means you hold it there. You got the metta there, you say, Ida kada kada amra. Fa innama yakunu lahu kun fayakun. See? Ma kana lillahi an yatad. The tajjida min walid. Subhanahu. Ida kada amra. Fa'innama yukulu lahu kun fayakun. Okay. Now let's translate it. It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget 
a son. Glory be to him. When he determines a matter, he only says to it, Kun. Now that word in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the script here is Kun. 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 It's Kun. And it's the Kun. Kun. The word of God. Kun. B. And this is what we want to talk about today, just briefly, is the significance of the word of God. So, you know, in Bible, and many of us are from Christian orientation, many of that lingers with us. We don't, we don't, we're, we're new to Al-Islam. We're encouraged to study the language. Not that we want to be Arabs, we want to jump out of an African-American body and jump in an Arab body. We want to study the Lugul Arabia in this Quran, the Fusa, so we can understand what Almighty God is communicating to us. Our impetus for studying the Lugul, the Arabic, is not to become Arabs. Not to jump out of, I'm perfectly satisfied with my body. <laughs> with who I am. <laughs> I don't want to jump out in somebody else's body. So, we want to learn the, the Lugal Arabia, find out the Fusa, what Almighty God is communicating to us. That's the emphasis. So, it says, it is not befitting to the majesty of God that he should beget a son. The concept of begetting is an animal. It's a, it's a, a, a God doesn't have to beget. God is neither beget, he, he doesn't beget, nor was he begot. We'll, we'll get to it. We, we want to take it slow. We don't want to take it too fast. We'll get to it. And in St. John Bible, it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. So there's uh, a connection here. How is these things important? These are weighty things. And it says that the one who becomes, that the one who was Christian and now he becomes Muslim, he gets a double reward. You get a double reward. If you were a Christian, you become Muslim, you get a double reward. What is this double reward? Because when you become Muslim, you don't have to reject Jesus. So now when you become Muslim, you have Jesus and Muhammad, the last of the messengers to Almighty God. And it's said that this one, Muhammad, was mentioned in previous scripture. So those that knew Revelation, knew of this one that was to come called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that means may the certainty of peace and blessings be upon him. The previous scripture knew that this one that was to come, in fact, Muhammad thought he was crazy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He thought he was crazy when he received the revelation. And his wife Khadijah consoled him. No, you're not crazy. You're honorable. You're decent. This is what she, she consoled him. No, in fact, Khadija, his wife, told him, I have an uncle who is a Christian, who is familiar with scripture. And her cousin, rather, her cousin, Khadija's cousin, who was familiar with scripture, said, this one is the promised prophet that our scriptures speak about. See, those who knew scripture knew the prophecy that all the children of Abraham would get a blessing. All the seeds of Abraham. Many of the, those that study Bible, study uh, Old Testament, New Testament, know that the prophecy of Abraham was all the children of Abraham would get a blessing. And Abraham was called the, the, the patriarch of the, uh, the three major religions, uh, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. 
and Abraham's oldest son, Ishmael. Isaac came later because first Sarah couldn't have a child. Those that understand their scripture, the Christian scripture, it uses the terminology in, in here, Nasar, the Nasar and the Yahud, ancient names for the same communities. It says that they knew that the descendants, see Sarah couldn't have a child, and the maid woman, according to the Bible, I'm speaking from Bible now, the maid woman was named Hagar, and Muslims call her Hajar. She worked in the house of Abraham and Sarah, but Sarah couldn't have a child. And at that time, it was a custom that a man could have more than one wife. Islam just come to set a limit to it. But the Christians and the Jews practiced polygamy in that day. So what happened was is that Hagar had the child for Abraham, and his name was Ishmael. And I think the Bible says, I think it's in the 17th chapter of Genesis, it says that, that Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born and 100 years old when Isaac was born. So that makes Ishmael the oldest son of Abraham, by 14 years, older than his brother Isaac. But anyway, the Christians and the Jews come from Isaac. And the Muslims come from Ishmael through Kedar. In fact, in the Bible, it has the 12 tribes of Isaac and it has the 12 tribes of Ishmael. So those that knew scripture, those that they, the masses don't really study scripture. They don't really know it. The leaders, they don't give the knowledge to the sheep. The rams know it. <laughs> sheep get slaughtered and it's all gone. But anyway, the prophecy was that one would come from that descendancy. And the Quran speaks of it, it says they knew the name of this one to come like they knew the names of their own sons, but they hid this information. That the ones that was going to come with revelation from the other tribe, they hid that. They said, no, we don't need it anymore. We are the ones with strong nationalistic tendencies. I'm going to stay in the lead. We'll give the, the Gentile this, and we'll give the, the, the uh, but the law's light is one. We can say much more about that, but we want to deal with the importance of God's word. So when you become a Muslim, you don't have to give up Jesus. So I see many of my Christian brothers and sisters, and I love them, because their prophet is our prophet. I couldn't be a Muslim if I didn't love Jesus and Moses and all of them. In fact, one of the premises, the arts of the faith, is we have to not only accept the prophets, but we accept the books that they brought. So you don't see those little silly hang-ups among the true Muslim. Between Christian, yeah, Christian, and, and, and this is a, and, you know, you find Muslims in the dark on, on what their relationship is. Going to bring in all that weakness. Trifling, but he's going to make it out a religious issue. Mm. They rejected me because I'm Muslim. No, that Christian might be rejecting you because you're lazy. Because mm. you are not truthful. Oh, brother, we can say a lot about that. So you don't have to, you will receive a double blessing and a double reward when you become Muslim. So, those who studied scripture, they knew this reality. So when we say something about Jesus, we see something about the prophet, we consider this an act of love. We love our Christian brothers and sisters. When we help them and show them of something that our scripture says in relationship, what we have in relationship and in common with our Christian brothers and sisters. We have a lot in common with them. So when we consider this really an act of love when we began to show them that all of the prophets were brothers. In fact, we have a saying in our religion that the, that the Muslim 
is one who loves for his brother what he loves for himself. So when we find the excellence and the beauty and the wonder and the satisfaction in this Quran, we want our Christian brothers and sisters to know that relationship in a truthful way. And we want to share with them. We want to share with them this light. It says that whenever Allah sends to the people a prophet, he sends them a prophet speaking into the language of the people. The Christian language is not Quranic language. This is what we have to understand. The Christian language is not Quranic language. And the Quranic language is not Christian language, what we alluded to earlier. When the Christian says faith, he has a way of understanding faith. When the Muslim says faith or iman, he has a certain way, a certain language, a Quranic way of understanding iman or faith. But we have a connection. There's a relationship between us. When you become Muslim, you get a double reward because you accept not only Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all of them. I know what many of the other groups say about the prophets of God. Maybe this is why they have a different sort of interpretation. Because they say Lot, he laid with his own daughters. They say David, Daoud, saw, saw uh, sent one of his generals out to battle because he got real excited when the man's wife was disrobing Bathsheba. And we know many, many stories of the prophets. So when, they, when you call Jesus a prophet, oh, you hey, you big problem. But no, Quranic language is different. From Christian way of understanding, we have to know the difference. The word of God is so important. It's so important that we have to understand the difference. So there's a thing that's an issue. We don't just pick any issue. When we talk to our Christian brothers and share with them this information, we pick those very central issues, those very weighty issues. And this is what it's about. Many of the things in the Bible, there's nothing wrong with them. Any knowledgeable Muslim would have no problem whatsoever. Where the problem comes it is the interpretation of the word. And in the context of the word. But well, once you understand the context of the word, there's no problem. You find the true Muslim and the true Christian, the, the differences are almost imperceptible. Those Christians that understand the nuances of the language and the translations and this and that and the other, but it's the, the ones, the credentialed ones, many of them way up there on high, they have a cleanup message, but the masses of the people don't get it. But we have to understand the difference. Let's read what uh, uh, the Quran says about this issue. Now when we say, before we read this Quran, this is in the fifth ayah, Al-Ma'idah, the 82nd ayah. Now, before we read it, we say, A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitan. I seek refuge in Allah. Five. Khamsa. Five. Al-Ma'idah. He said, okay, it says, well, before we read it, we say, A'udhu Billahi Mani Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. Now, A'udhu Billahi Mani Shaitan means, I seek refuge in Allah because I don't want anything to rear up in me while I'm reading this. That's not right. So we pray for Allah's guidance and protection even when we read the Quran, the script. I don't want to share with you anything that's not correct. I don't want that, any of that old devil, the old jinn around up in me. <laughs> so I pray right away. <coughs> oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. 
from the regime, from the rejected shaitan. Then we say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, with the name Allah, the beneficent benefactor, the beneficent redeemer. Then we begin to read. Are you? Do you have that, uh, brother Thailand? Uh, fifth eight, chapter, fifth, fifth surah. Okay. Eighty-second. Eighty-two. Got that? Okay, 82. La tajida, la tajida, la tajidan, la tajidanna, la tajidanna, ashadan nas, ashadan nasi, adawatan lilladina amirul yahud, walladina sharaku. We'll read that again. Latajidanna, Latajidanna, Ashaddan Nasi Adawatan Lilladina Amarul Yahudda, Yahudda, Walladina Asharaku. Now, Yahud, Yahud, Yahudda. Yahud is an ancient word, a, a, a more correct word of this, this, this saying that community Jew. Because we know the word Jew, you go back in beyond the 8th century, you won't find it in religious scripture. The word Jew is a very new innovation. You won't find it in antiquity. You won't find it in the, in the scripture. You go back. So, Yahud. Yahud. And then we, we, then we use it, we use a lot of these words, it's like Christ and Christos and a lot of different things. It's Greek for in the Greek, which is ancient language or whatever. Yahuda, Yahuda Levina, Ashrafu, Ashrafu, Watajidanna, Akra, Akra, Nahum, Mawaddatan, Lilavina, Amanu ladina qalu inna nasar. Now nasar is that ancient word for the Christian community. Nasar. Nasar. You ask the average Arabic speaking person, Nasar, he knows instantly. You talk about that community. Nasar. So when you go back, when you go closer and closer and closer to the root, you'll find the similarities. The further you get away from the root, then that's when the differences are accentuated. So what was wrong, what wrong was given by Paul is rather new in ancient religion of that community, the Nasada community. The Nasada community, no problem. The Nasada, just like even today, a Coptic Christian can say a prayer and, 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 and his prayer and your prayer, it'd be almost, it, it, they, they won't, we won't have problems with that. <laughs> and as much more can be said to that, but, but it, it was not in the scope of what we're saying today. The Messiah, the Erika, the Anna, Minhum, Kisisina, Wa Ruhbana, Wa Anna, Hum, La Yas Taq Biru, Sarakallahu Adin. And it's it translated strongest among men in enmity. Strongest among men in enmity to the believers will thou find the Jews and the pagans. You, do you have that in there? You have that? You reading it now? The strongest among men in enmity? You have that? Yes, sir. I, I see it. Okay. Do you read that? Read it in English. Strongest among, well, what, what's that translate? What translation do you have there? Translation of Quran. Is that Yusuf Ali or uh, Pictal or who is that? Arbery? It could be Arbery. Okay. Okay. What does the English in your general translation? What it says? Yeah, what does the English say? Okay, it says, You shall certainly find Jews and those who associate partners with Allah, the most vehement, ve 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 okay. enmity against those who believe. You, sh you shall certainly find those who say, we are Christians, the newest in friendship towards those who believe. Okay, so you'll find those who are Christian closer to the Muslims. Yeah. Then you would find those the Jews and the pagans. 
In other words, it says that those would have enmity and hatred for the Muslims. You'll find it stronger against the Muslims coming from the, the Jews and the pagans more so than the Christians. Because the Christians are those who would stay. You'll find great love between the Christians and the Muslims more so between the Jews and the pagans. Now, 14 centuries ago, when this revelation was revealed to our beloved prophet, if a person wanted to, to more or less sway the people in the wrong way, like some of these devils want to do, all they had to do was say, well, look, I'm going to prove your Quran wrong. I'm going to be closer, me being a Jew or a pagan, I'm going to be closer to the Muslims than the Christians. You see that? In other words, they read the Quran. The Quran says, the strongest among men in enmity to the believers would you find the Jews and the pagans. And the nearest among them in love to the believers would you find those who say we are Christians. Because among these are men devoted to learning and men who have renounced the world and they are not arrogant. And I think so. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, in a sense, most of, uh, all the translations have that essence. You'll find the enmity and hatred for the Muslims coming from the Jews and the pagans, most of the Christians. Now, let's think on this a little bit further. The Jews are much closer in practice in their religion as we are. Okay? They have kosher, we have halal. They're eating the way they eat. They, the, uh, the, the practicing Jew does not eat kinzir, the one that's truthful. He doesn't eat kinzir. And I have met practicing Christians who won't touch the stuff. They won't touch kinzir or hog or pig. They won't touch practicing Christians. I've met them. So, but the Jews' practice is real close. The one God, I think what they call the Shema, they uh, believe in no God but the God. No partners with God. They are strong in, in their monotheistic beliefs. But we find hatred and enmity coming from them against the Muslims because of that strong nationalistic idea. That's why we as Muslims who come into this religion rather recently, we staunchly oppose Arabism. We equate Arabism with nationalism. Allah owns all the nations. <laughs> you know, I'm a nationalist. <laughs> Allah owns all the nations. And we use a word called Ummah, Ummah, Ummah to Islamia. And in that word Ummah, you also see nation. But you also see mother. That caring, that genuine caring for all of her children. <laughs> so we don't have that. That nationalistic, you know, my, I got the best and you is illegitimate and, and this and, and you don't have a Jewish mother, you're not kosher and, and, and uh, 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 you don't, uh, this and that and the other. You know, people have these hang-ups. Some Arabs go into Arabism and say, well, uh, our beloved prophet, he was Arab, so I am, um, you know, and they have a certain condescension. Hang-ups when they see this black skin. <laughs> we, so we don't, we don't subscribe. So this is have a real weighty message. To it. So we find that that the Christians, that we're, we're real close to our Christian brothers and sisters. We have certain ways of seeing the world, but we have to know how we see these concepts and how they see them. Okay. So a lot of what has been said about Jesus is not what's actually in the Bible. This is the point. What's said about Jesus, Aisha, is not in the Bible. What is said, what they end up with, is through interpretations. And misinterpretations at that. And many of the things said about Jesus come from interpretation. And many of these things are out of context. They don't mean what the interpretation suggests. If you read the actual words, so those things in Bible that support Trinity, those things in Bible that support Son of God, if you go further with it with what's actually said, you won't see what they interpret it to be. So when you see Son of God, there are many people in Bible that were called Son of God. David was called Son of God. Adam. 
I think in 338, I think it's in Luke, Adam was called son of God. You go down the list. In Old Testament, it said, no one born of a woman. You are nothing but a man. And it mentions son of man. No one born of a woman can be God. So when we want to really understand what Jesus said, we have to use the dictionary that Jesus used. And that was the Old Testament in the context of Old Testament language and terminology and syntax. He said, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. That's the dictionary that he used. I didn't come to abolish anything. I came to fulfill it. So a lot of these ideas have come by misinterpreting what's there before their very eyes. So what are we saying? We want the people to keep their religious spirit, to obey God, to be approved by God. Keep that. We're not saying you have to become Muslim and you have to become that or this and that and that. We don't force ourselves on people. It is God who makes Muslims, Allah who makes Muslims. Because we know that there are also Muslims who don't understand the validity and understanding of the scripture of the Quran, how it relates to other scriptures. And some of them say you shouldn't even mention the Bible in the presence of Muslims. Don't even mention it. They're nothing but Catholics. They're nothing but disbelief. They're Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. Every other word is Catholic. <laughs> I used to use, when I see a brother, I see an African American, he called us in, in Islam. How he used that word Catholic tells a lot who his teacher is. I just use that as a gauge. Catholic, Catholic, every other word, Catholic, the Catholic. <laughs> now, the Catholic, the disbelief. Everybody's a disbelief. And our beloved prophet, when he sought refuge, and we mentioned about when, when, he, when he asked his wife Khadija, and she said she, she's got an uncle, a cousin, that's a cousin that's a Christian. And then he inst instructed a group of the Muslim persecution got so bad in Mecca, the prophet instructed them to seek refuge in a Christian land, Abyssinia. Seek refuge in Africa, Ethiopia, where the Christians are. The prophet instructed them to go to Africa, Ethiopia, and seek refuge, which was a Christian land. And then they said, they, the pagan Arabs that chased them said, they don't respect, they, they told the king there, don't keep them here. They don't respect Jesus. They don't respect Christianity. They, they, and, and, and the king said, Show me what your book says about our beloved Jesus. And he showed me. And it was in the 19th chapter, and he read, where it says that Jesus is a sign and a word and a mercy from Almighty God. And tears came to the king's, king's eyes. And he said, let them have refuge here. You don't have to give up your spirit of Christianity. Just be truthful. We got Muslims right around the corner here selling, selling wine, lottery ticks, and everything. No born listening to the other Got Bismillah right under, right under the Hennessy. <laughs> We're not impressed because you speak Arabic. Then you go around the corner and see somebody get some uh, in the lottery line, and he's of uh, one born across the water somewhere. And then you say, well, I saw a real Muslim around the corner. And I put my numbers in. Then when you come see us working with Aleph, Bad, Tad, Thad, you don't know what in the hell is going on. This, this masala is not empty because of no reason. This is a challenge. But we shouldn't let that challenge dampen our spirits of the reality of what's going on. There are those that say you gas. They all kind of got a law right around their neck here. How much gas you want? Oh, I want a... I want gas. On top of them. He's looking at you. He got a law right here. The lottery. You want to put your lotteries in? 
And that was, that's condemned in this religion. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's condemned. Sure, Allah speaks of this. Games of chance. And, and, and alcohol. In fact, they just stay real close together because when you get your head back, you want to put a number down on something. <laughs> a lot know, know that human being that gets weak. So uh, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, what it is. <laughs> the word of God. Okay, we, we want to, uh, uh, there's so much we can say on that. Uh, we got Muslims, we have Muslims that don't understand, understand that relationship. So the same angel that came to Prophet Muhammad with the revelation is the same one that came to Moses with the revelation, the word of God. And we have similarities. God's word is, is, is one, there's no breaks in God's word. God's light is continuous. And some read the Quran, they carry it around. Oh, you can tell them. Just by sometimes a little nuance of the words they use. You can tell them what's happening. Some of them carry the Bible around, they carry the Quran around. They, they, oh, yeah. But God's word is to be found. Allah says that he would provide for you. But when your heart changes, your condition will automatically change. Mm. But the heart must first change. You know, you come with that old slick stuff. Hmm. Or you come with all kind of stuff. Some of them may be squirming. I've seen them. Hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> we as Muslims have to understand that relationship between other communities and scripture. Let's read. Uh, yeah, we already read the part about the uh, being it is. Let's say more more about that, and then we can we can close out. The uh, it says it is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that He should beget a son. Glory be to him. When he determines a matter, he only says to it be, and it is. God does not beget a son. God does not have semen. God does not have a consort. God doesn't have to have a woman to bring anything about. These are pagan, primitive concepts, anthropomorphic concepts that many people, in order to understand things, they make these associations. You know, sometimes you can see a person in interview, he might be a great sports figure or something. He say, yeah, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Oh, the man upstairs, show him looking out after me. Well, he, these anthropomorphic concepts, you know, it's a man upstairs that's looking to run in this thing. See? <laughs> <laughs> you understand that it is Allah who creates all men and women. The minute you say God is a man, then the women are all men. <laughs> so you got many women, they say, well, in order to be right in there, I'm going to have to be a man. So a woman, she takes on a man, she watches the man how he sits. Well, a woman would sit like this, so I'm going to sit like a man. Woman. She, uh, some of them, they're real good at these attributes. Or you find a man, he look at the woman. <laughs> God taking hormone pills, growing breasts and everything, <laughs> muscle mass begin to leave and he sit down and they got one on uh, that uh, you'd look and just feminine, hold his hand a certain way, uh, voice then went up and everything <laughs> and uh, changing what Allah has established. See, so what happens? When we deviate, Allah doesn't have to beget a son. If he wanted a son, he'd get one from one he has created. This is a primitive idea. Beget. And Allah says in the Quran, Walam Lam you let, Walam you let. 
He does not beget, nor was he begotten. How can God be born? Who, you see, and then you have one group say, God's mother. Big group. 